Well, here we are, part three of Memory of the Heart. And to tell you the truth, I could have had a part four. But don't worry, I'm not. <laughs> well, we've seen many trials of our four characters as they have traveled their yellow brick road and as they've moved on through, through all kinds of trials and have endured the, the things that they have endured on their way to the Emerald City. And we know that they are all seeking a rep to an audience with Oz so that the scarecrow can get a, a, um, a brain, the Tin Man can get a heart, and so that the Cowardly Lion can get courage. And so, so they're all on their way. And of course, Dorothy wants, just wants to go home. That's all she wants. She simply wants to go home. And you know, they've come across all kinds of things in their life that have been very, very difficult. And yet they've all seemed to rise to the occasion when that happened. And so, again, I'm using Jean Houston's book, The Wizard of Us, as a reference for this talk. Finally, our group gets to the Emer Emerald City. Well, they thought that was bad, but trying to get in to see Oz was even worse because they kept being put off and said no and all kinds of things happened. But finally, finally they got, they got an audience with Oz. And there was a big fanfare and, a much, and, and amid much bluster, uh, a large luminous head rises up amongst the smoke and the blasts of fire. And Dorothy steps forward. And this wizard scowls and bellows in a voice like thunder. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Who are you? We have come... Silence! The great, powerful Oz knows why you have come. Step forward. Then they each approach the wizard with fear and trembling, asking for the wizard's assistance. I, the great and powerful Oz, will grant your wishes if you will perform for me a small task. Bring me the Wicked Witch of the West's broomstick. Now they all realize that in order to get that broomstick, they're going to have to kill the witch. And they're all shaking and trembling with fear. This is not a small task, even though Oz makes it sound like it's no big deal. And so they, they begin their journey so that they can move forward. This is part of the initiation process that is a part of this hero's journey that we are all on. Don't forget, this is not just a fairy tale. It's the story of us as well. And so as we are in this process of the hero's journey, there are times when we come into those initiations. They are initiations that call us higher. They always call us to be greater than we thought we could ever be. And when we understand and look at this, we begin to see that there is something we must do first as a part of that initiation. And that is the point that is called an atonement with the Father. Now at this point, um, Oz is that Father. You know, in us, it's that thing that we never thought we could do. It's that thing that, that we have to rise above and able to, to move ahead. And so when we understand and look at this atonement from a higher level as at one moment, at one moment, then we begin to see that we can continue on this road we can continue on this road that is going to take us to the place where we want to be. We want to be in that spot where we have those things that we desire. And, and Oz, you know, for, for Dorothy and, and her friends, 
Oz holds that, and, and he is challenging them to move on beyond what they ever thought they could do, those perceived boundaries that we all have and that we have created for ourselves. And so the wizard demands that they perform a task to prove their true worth. And we do that for ourselves as well. We are constantly saying, okay, you know, I have to overcome this in order to prove my true worth. And we do that for ourselves. And remember, you know, they want this so that they can gain not only, not only those things that they feel like they need that they don't think they have, but it's for the greater good as well. And that's why we are doing what we are doing. That's why we are on this path to become greater and more than we ever thought we could be. Because we have a job to do in this world. And that is to bring ourselves higher so that we can bring others around us higher as well. So remember that each of us has a task that we might think is impossible to accomplish. And most of us have done things that we thought were impossible. Haven't you done something in your life that you thought was impossible? I'll bet every one of you has. I know I have. I've done things that I never thought was possible. I never thought I'd be up here speaking to a group of people, ever. So let us remember that nothing is impossible to us, which is in broomsticks notwithstanding. Now, remember, adventures are filled with opportunities for growth rather than attacks from the outside that, um, and that we are victims. We are not victims. But, you know, sometimes we like to pretend to be one because our ego just doesn't want to take responsibility for what's going on in our life. We just don't want anything to do with that because, you know, we might not look as perfect to others as we like to think we are, or if we don't think we are, we want others to think we are. And so adversity is not something that a superior, cruel, unseen force is doing to us just for kicks. You know, we are active co-creators in our life. We are active co-creators. You know, they, life doesn't just happen to us. We are creating this wonderful scenario that we have created in order to grow and become so much more than we ever thought we could be. Unfortunate pitfalls um, or misplaced steps along our yellow brick road are, are just simply um, opportunities for our growth. And so Dorothy and her friends leave the Emerald City and enter a shadowy world with no yellow brick road to guide them. So they're kind of like out in this wilderness, and I think we've talked about this wilderness experience before here. And this is kind of like a parallel image of this bleak Kansas scene that we saw in the very beginning of our story. And this is a world of limiting thoughts and potentials. And when the witch sees them coming, and the witch has only one eye that sees, but man, she can see miles away, and she sees our three friends coming through the woods. They don't know where they're going. You know, they, they do see a sign that says, witch's castle, one mile. But other than that, you know, they're not sure exactly how they're going to get there. So anyway, she sends, remember, those awful flying monkeys? Eek! Well, she sends them to go and take care of the friends and to bring, to bring uh, Dorothy to her. And so that's what they do. And these monkeys represent those things in our lives that keep us from moving forward. You know, they can stop us right in, their, in our tracks and, and keep us from moving forward. And they can pick us up and carry us off in the wrong direction taking us where we really do or don't want to go because they are the ones that kind of scramble our thoughts and twist and churn, going out of control. And sometimes all of our everyday obligations are like those monkeys. You know, we talk about monkey mind in unity. These are monkey mind to the max. 
And so our thoughts, you know, just, just don't become clear. They become all jumbled and we, we get caught up in our obligations of everyday living and as a result of that, we do not reach our goals. But the flying monkeys cat, uh, capture Dorothy and Toto and take her off to the castle. And um, they leave the scarecrow shredded and scattered. And this would certainly have been one of the scarecrow's greatest fears because once he's ripped apart, he appears to have no substance at all. And the scarecrow asks the tin man and the lion to put him back together fast. Here he is, he's scattered all over the ground, but his first thought is to go and save Dorothy. And so he says, hurry up guys, you've got to put me back together, we've got to go save Dorothy. And so the Wicked Witch, in the meantime, has locked Dorothy in her dark gothic castle up in a tower. And Dorothy, Dorothy is, is, um, is, is very perplexed at the time and she just doesn't know what she's going to do and, and, and the witch wants Dorothy's red ruby slippers and she says to her, okay Dorothy, I won't, um, I won't kill Toto if you'll give me your red ruby slippers. And Dorothy, not knowing that they had really phenomenal powers and magical properties, agrees. But when the witch grabs them to take them off her feet, they shoot out sparks which burn her fingers. And then she realizes that she'll never get those, those, those slippers until Dorothy's dead. But she's got a problem. She can't kill Dorothy because Dorothy has the protection of goodness or of the divine. And so she's not sure exactly what she's going to do. And about that time, our little ever faithful Toto jumps out of the basket and runs down the dark stairwells and, and, and hallways. Run, Toto, run! <laughs> and run he does out of the castle to find the other heroes to, like, to lead them back to where Dorothy is. So let's take a moment to remember one thing. All of the characters are us. Even the witch and those awful shadowy characters, the monkeys. And the witch represents our shadow side. That's the part of us that we stick deep in that dark castle of our consciousness when, when in a corner, because we have many, many, many mansions in our consciousness. And we, we, we poke it away where we can't see it. And we hope no one else can because we don't want. Those are all the things that we've, we've said aren't OK about us. And, and we've decided, you know, this is OK and that's not OK. And so therefore, I'm not going to acknowledge what's not OK. And I'm going to stick it in the castle. And there it gets worse. It expands and gets worse. So, so that's, what, that's what the witch represents in us. We all have a witch. you know what yours is? Is it green? Because it probably is, or it wouldn't be so bad. I mean, if you were born green, you know, you might be cranky too. <laughs> Those things that we have pushed into the dark, shadowy recesses of our consciousness are there, and they come out at those odd times when you don't want them to come out. Uh, you know when you say something it just comes out of your mouth before you ever wanted to, it to come out and, you, and, you, and you, you want to grab it back and you can't? That's that shadow, that shadow coming out. And it's coming out and, and saying and acting in ways that uh, are, are not good. At this point, Dorothy loses her optimism. She misses Auntie M. And she's feeling really down. Here she is. She's in this tower all by herself. All of her friends are dispersed, she doesn't know where they are. Toto has run off and she knows probably that what he's about. But, but nonetheless, she's all by herself and she's alone and she feels really, really bad. And she goes into kind of a depression. And 
you know, she loses all that wonderful optimism that she has had all along to help her friends, you know, along on the road. And, and she sinks into deep de depression. And this is usually termed as the lowest point in a hero's journey. And so anytime we're on a hero's journey, there will probably come a time when we'll go into this deep, deep depression stage that we, we in, you know, in the religious or, or spiritual community call the dark night of the soul. And in this dark night of the soul, we lose all hope. It's as if there's nothing that's going to be able to pick us up and pull us out of this deep hole that we seem to be in. And yet, this is also where the deepest understanding comes in. It's, it's where one's true nature and soul's purpose are presented. And so this is an important, an important step in our journey. It's a necessary step for us to be able to step back and say, you know, things are hopeless. And then bring ourselves back up. And so Houston says, by entering this stage, our hero shows a willingness to undergo metamorphosis. It is during this time of the long dark night that the interior depths must be tapped even further in order to find the strength and inner resources to eventually emerge as the true hero. So how do we do this? How do we do this when we're in that deep, deep place? You've all been there, so you've, and you're not there now, I hope. So you know how you got out. I know I've been there, and I know how I got out. And so one of the things that uh, Houston says is that we must rally physically, mentally, and spiritually to uplift ourselves to escape from the doldrums and wade into the floods that life has in store for us. We must pull ourselves up. And when mired down in our own dark night of the soul, the first thing to do is to get your body moving. That's usually not easy because the first thing you want to do is go into the closet, cover up your head with a blanket, and curl into a ball. You don't want to see anybody. You don't want to talk to anybody. You just want to feel miserable. And sometimes it feels so good. <laughs> but what we need to do is get up and get moving. And to shock our senses and get going. And when in doubt, plunge your bare feet into snow, so to speak. <laughs> do something to wake yourself up and get moving in another direction. So let's fast forward now to Dorothy's friends again. The scarecrow hatches a clever plan. Not bad for having no brain, and he's been doing this all along, hasn't he? They disguise themselves as guards and march into the castle. They finally find Dorothy, and they've been all over the place. The castle is like a maze. And so they finally find her, but also the guards find them. And so they're all in this tower with no escape, along with the witch. And the witch then vows to kill all of Dorothy's friends, starting with the scarecrow. How about a little fire, scarecrow? <laughs> Dorothy quickly picks up a bucket of water and tosses it on the scarecrow to put out the fire, but accidentally also drenches the witch. The creature hisses and screams that she begins to melt. Oh, you cursed brat! Look what you've done! I'm melting! Melting! Oh, what a world! What a world! Who would have thought that a good girl like you could destroy my beautiful wickedness? <laughs> water of life that's been pushed on her or dropped on her or thrown on her um, is poison to her evil system and she continues to steam and melt as she, dis as she dissolves and shrivels from sight. 
And what does this tell us? Bringing living water into any situation and the old decaying institutes, institutions cannot maintain their dusty structures. You see, this living water is the truth. It is that, that truth that we know deep within us of, of renewal. It's a time of renewing our strength. And how could you bring water into those dusty structures? This is a question that we're all asking ourselves these days. How can we bring this living water into these dusty structures of education and health and local government and other issues that concern us? A question that we are all striving to know because something new is evolving in our world right now. And as a result of it, we have got to change to be able to accept it and to help it unfold. Then our characters return to Oz. See, we brought you the witch's broomstick. Now please, grant us our request. Well, I, uh, but, but you've already got what you want. You've had them all the time. What do you mean we've had them all the time? Right, you promised us real things. A brain for me, and a heart for the tin man, and courage for the lion. And then Toto exposes the man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. I am the great and powerful Oz. <laughs> he hardly believes that himself. <laughs> Then an incredible thing happens. The wizard, in human clothing, smiles. He seems wise and eloquent as he then gives them the tokens of their desires. Psychoanalyst David Magster has suggested that the scarecrow, the tin man, and the cowardly lion represent syndromes with which most therapists are familiar. Low self-esteem based on the sense that one is not intelligent or capable of dealing with the world as one would like to, or a sense of inability to respond emotionally or effectively, and anxiety of fearfulness in dealing with the day-to-day -day problems of living. And so our friends lacked one thing. And that was belief. They just didn't believe that they had these things in them. They had already demonstrated these very qualities. And they imagined they were lacking. And yet we've seen through the entire story that they all seem to be able to envision, to, to be able to demonstrate these in their life. And by giving them visible tokens, like a diploma, a watch shaped like a heart, and a medal of courage, Oz gave them what they needed by putting in them in touch with their true selves. And so these, these, these little trinkets were all they were lacking in order to convince them that yes, they did have these things all along. And Oz promises to take Dorothy back to Kansas himself. But Dorothy is out chasing Toto because he's run off to chase a cat and, and she misses the balloon and they can't hold it down any longer because they built this big fire and up it goes and she sees it going up into the air and she is devastated. She is heartbroken and she has not achieved the reward of her quest. Everyone else has but not her. All she wanted was to go home. She only wanted to go home. And it is at this point that the focus of the deep nature, the forces of the true and totally unexpected good can come and intervene. And so Glinda, the good witch of the North, arrives in a bubble of light. Oh, Glinda, the wizard is gone, and now I don't know how I'll ever get home. Can you help me? My dear, you've always had the power to return home. Just click your heels together three times and say, there's no place like home. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell her that before? <laughs> because she wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn it for herself. So, what have you learned, Dorothy? Well, 
I think that it wasn't enough just to want to see Uncle Henry and Auntie M. And if that's if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there, I never really lost it to begin with. Is that right? That's all it is. <laughs> so Dorothy goes back to Kansas and begins to see things differently. She begins to see that there's so much more beauty and so much more color in Kansas than she had thought before. And now she is in a position to make a difference in the world because now she believes that she can. I'd like to close with a poem by our own Marlene Hawley. You're here, aren't you, Marlene? I see you. It's called The Land of Oz. Is there an emerald city or a somewhere over the rainbow? Can we leave yesterday behind and click our heels like Dorothy and find ourselves in tomorrow? Is life like Oz or more like Kansas? Maybe life is a combination of the two. For in reality, one cannot exist without the other. There will always be witches and good fairies, broken-hearted people, people who need more courage, and those seeking more knowledge. So if we stay focused on the Emerald City, our walk through Kansas won't seem so bad. And maybe, just maybe, Kansas is not such a bad place to be. For it's not the grand that will satisfy our needs, but the totos and the Auntie M's that will get us through life and when the curtain of life falls, it will be the seemingly small things that will matter in our lives. Faith, hope, love, strength, courage, and gratitude will lead and carry us through and deliver us to that rainbow. Thank you. God bless.